here. And we are so excited that he was here before we are. And today we are excited about an opportunity to worship the Lord here at 815. Uh, we have made the decision tentatively to continue our early service uh, from this point forward. We want to say a special word of thank you to our ushers and, and our musicians and all the technology people who are helping pull these things off here on site on the church hilltop in the facility, broadcasting to the parking lot and also broadcasting to places around the world as we're finding out through the internet. So for the next few weeks, it is our plan to continue on having an early service and an 11 o'clock service. And so we know many of you, that is, uh, this is your preferred time to get up early with the sun and to see God's creation and to worship him. We'd like to begin each worship service here at Bethesda with a song and scripture and prayer. And let me begin by reading a verse of scripture out of the book of Romans chapter 12 that says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your minds, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you that it is another day that you've given us to be able to live. And God, we confess to you what you know about us, and that is every day we wake up, we seek to uh, live to gratify our flesh. And God, we thank you that there is another spirit within us, a new spirit, the spirit of Christ that came into us when we were born again. Lord, you call us to live not according to the spirit of this world, but the spirit of Jesus. Not to be conformed because of our flesh and our natural desires. But God, we ask you to empower us to live your perfect will this morning and tomorrow and the next day. And God, we thank you that this is the day that you have made and we want to rejoice and be glad in it. And we pray today that our worship would be pleasing. And that your word would not return void. God, that we would do your will in this place. Thank you for each one that is here helping lead in worship. Thank you for each one that is here helping participate to those around the world who are lifting up their praises and their hearts to you. God, we thank you that you're the King of kings and Lord of lords, and you are our Prince of Peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. 
that we would be praying for our nation, praying for all the nations of the world who are fighting through this virus and those who are leading and making decisions and governments all around the world, including ours and those who are helping in medical areas and all sorts of emergency response. And we're going to have a time of prayer. And I want to ask Brother Lee Rankin, if you would, to lead us in a word of prayer this morning for those uh, who are helping us and those who need the help of the Lord to know what decisions to make and how to guide them. Dear Heavenly Father, it's an honor and privilege to be able to come to your house and worship today, Lord. Lord, we're just thankful for the many blessings you've given us. Lord, we pray for those that are putting themselves out on the front lines during this time of this virus, Lord. Lord, we ask that your protection be over. Lord, we ask that if there be anyone here that needs to have a personal relationship with you, Lord, that today might be the day that they might make that decision. We ask all these things in your Son, Jesus' name, and he's worthy. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Lee. Thank each one of you. And I don't want to spend each week uh, in a long, drawn-out commentary over our social uh, difficulties in this disease. But uh, it is a praise I want to give that it seems like maybe a, a tide has turned slowly, at least in our country and areas uh, where things are better. But I'll just add my voice to a chorus of thousands that would say, that doesn't mean it's over and we don't need to let our guard down. And so... We will continue here at the church to minister in the ways that we feel like are appropriate in accordance with guidance we've been given. And so social distancing and, and parking lot church will continue for the foreseeable future. And uh, we believe God's using that. I've had several people contact me, some of those who are shut-in, saying, Preacher, when this virus is over, you're not going to quit live streaming, are you? And I said, well, we've really talked about this and prayed about it uh, for a long time. And, and, and maybe... This has been the push that we've needed to get to where we need to be. And so, no, we, we do not intend on stopping uh, the live streams. Uh, if the Lord will empower that, we'll continue to do that. And so we're excited that God has opened up some new avenues for us. And in doing that, we believe that will help many who cannot get to church on a regular basis, uh, whether or not there's a novel virus going on or not. Other things inflict people's uh, health and lives on a regular basis. And so we remember those who are shut in, not by this virus, but by other things going on in their life. If you have your Bible, your copy of God's Word, I want to invite you to turn with me and turn to the book of Matthew. Uh, we took a, uh, a one-week brief hiatus from that book. Last week, as we were focusing on the resurrection, we believe that Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, uh, is a passage that finds its greatest meaning in our day and time because of the resurrection. As we read the Beatitudes, the attitudes of Christ, and the attitudes that Christ tells us that his followers would have, one of the things that is continually obvious to me is that we cannot be these things unless we have a Christ, a Savior, who has risen and who has empowered us to have these attitudes. And so we're going to once again be talking about the topic of the attitudes of Christ and his followers. And today's title, if we had one, would be, Who is your father? Who is your father? That's a very important thing in our life. Many people uh, take great pride, some take shame, in who their parents are. Uh, I grew up in this community. I grew up in a family that I'm proud to be a part of. I grew up often being asked, is this person your father or is this person your grandfather? I will share that uh, many of you know I'm a twin. We, walk, we used to have red hair before it fell out. And so we were some uh, red-headed twins in the Redbud community in the Redbud school system. And, uh, and people would always run up to us because we, we were famous, they thought. And they would always want to know who our parents were. And I used to take great pride in that, except the fact they would always want to know, um, were we the Brandon twins, is what they would want to know. And some of you do not realize that one of our local politicians and uh, funeral home directors, Max Brandon, uh, had twin boys, uh, Brent and Brian, and they were about the same age. And so I was often asked, hey, you know, I know you, I remember when y'all were born, uh, you're one of those Brandon twins. And so no, we were not part of the Brandon twins, but uh, they are, that family is our, our, our friends of our family. Uh, we all go through life finding some identity somewhere. Some maybe wishing we had a different identity. 
a better identity. And in the text today, if you will read along with me, we're in Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. Jesus teaching his disciples on the hillside these attitudes of his followers, what would, what would mark them, how they would be known. He says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you today. For, for earthly family, we thank you for good parents and good siblings, the good community and schools that we grew up in. Those are blessings. But Lord, at the same time, we realize not everybody has those blessings in life. And Lord, we thank you that it's not your will that anybody would perpetually have a poor reputation or anonymity for eternity. But God, it's your will, it's your plan that we don't have to be conformed to this world. Other people's expectations of us, our family line, habits and addictions and traits and tics and personality disorders that would mold us and make us into one thing can be overcome with the blood of Jesus. We thank you that we can be born again into a new family. And in this family, we are called to be missionaries and ambassadors for the one who made peace for us. God, we thank you that we can be your peacemakers. And people will see us and know us and they can call us sons of God, children of God. Lord, we say thank you. We don't deserve that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are looking at the Beatitudes and God is convicting us and continually convincing us of who we're supposed to be in Him. It's our prayer each time we stand that we would do at least two things. And one is that if you're here on this hilltop today or if you are somewhere in the world listening to this or watching this by video, that you would know for sure by the time this is over that you certainly are a child of God and that you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, that we are heirs with him, joint heirs with him in Christ because of his will and his work in us. And, and if you don't know that now, it's our prayer that you would know that before this service is over. Our second goal most every week is to preach to those who know Jesus and, and who know that they know him and he knows them. And encourage one another in the word and in his will to go forward and accomplish his will in our life that we would be transformed and that the work of Christ would go on in us in a way that would mark us as different, totally different and unique. So today, I want to point to the fact in this scripture that peace is the characteristic that Christians are visibly marked by in a way that makes us known to the world that we belong to Jesus. It's that peaceable attitude. It's that peaceable spirit. It does not say, blessed are the troublemakers. Now, it's, it's quite evident to some, especially if you've been around church for any period of time, one of the great blights upon the history and the mark of the church, whether it be centuries ago in the times of crusades and things like that, that one of the, the batting rams used against us is our own aggressive vitriol and aggressiveness to get angry and, and be divisive in our spirit. It does not tell us that the sons and daughters of Jesus should be known by our troublemaking. Quite the opposite. The Bible tells us very powerfully that there's a happy blessing to be called a peacemaker. I want to ask you, by the way, have you ever really known a happy troublemaker? No, they, they seem always willing to make trouble. They seem ready to make trouble, but 
happiness is not really one of the things that we would say shows forward in the life of a troublemaker. Peace is that characteristic of the Christian that visibly marks our life. It is that characteristic that Jesus points to and uses a word that, as I studied this week, I found is only used one time in the whole New Testament. Ereno, ereno poios. My wife tells me I shouldn't try to speak Greek, but I point that out to you because it's a conjunction of two words. One word which is used often in the New Testament. And that is the word for peace. We're familiar that Jesus was the Prince of Peace. At the birth of Jesus, it was heralded that it's a time of peace, that the one who could bring peace has come. In the ministry of Jesus, in Mark and in Luke, in two different places, Jesus would perform healings. And he said to the one, he, he healed, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed. Jesus, not just worried about bringing a relief from an ailment or or a reviving of a death of a loved one, he would leave them with that reminder that his greatest blessing in their life was not new life physically, but it was new life spiritually. Go in peace and be healed. And Luke, he says, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. And in Luke, again, in chapter 8, he says, daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. And so Jesus came, and when he interacted with people, the characteristic that he imparted on them and left with them and the injunction that he gave them was to be people of peace. That word for tranquility that is there many, many times in the life of Jesus in the New Testament. But in this passage, that word for peace is compounded and added with a word that would be to be a doer. A peace doer is what Jesus said. Now, see, often people say, well, to be a Christian is to be a, a pure pacifist. And that means I'm just at peace. So my neighbor's in anxiety and trouble or difficulty, but I'm not going to have anything to do with that. Or maybe I'm going down a roadside and somebody's beaten and, and abused and, and, and they look like they're in trouble, but to get involved with that would bring anxiety and difficulty and hardship in my life. And so I, I'm a peace person, and so I just want to stay out of that. There's a conflict going on and, and, and there's a decision that has to be made and yet yeah, but I'm a peaceable person. I'm a pacifist and I want to stay away from that. Well that's not what the word means that Jesus used here. He calls us to be peace doers. Not just living in a tranquility apart from the world with moats and walls and barbed wire around our existence so that no one can break in and no one can bother us and blind it to the travails and difficulties of the world, but to be involved in a world where there's great amounts of difficulty and anxiety and division and hatred and wars, but to be a difference maker for the cause of peace in those areas. We as Christians often have opportunities to involve ourselves. The word for doing there is the same word that Jesus used in Matthew where he says, therefore, bear fruit worthy of repentance. That bearing is the same word for doing. A peace doer is a spiritual fruit maker in the kingdom of God in Matthew 3 and 8. Matthew 4, 19, he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men to be doers of the gospel. Jesus tells us to be peacemakers, peace doers. So I want you to think this morning, if you will, about being a person, yes, that preserves peace where it exists. We mentioned the fact that Christians are often known as troublemakers and pot stirrers, where we find a, a possibility for disruption and we just stir it up. Well, that's not what God calls us to do at all. If there's peace in your home and peace in your workplace, you ought to be one who is a part of that and enjoying of that. And we have peace with God because of who Jesus is. And we ought to, we ought to relish that existence we have. When things get slightly troubled and you hear the winds of war, whether it be socially or, or in a familial context or at work, we ought to be those who seek to perpetuate the peace as long as possible. Do all we can. Go as far as we can. Jesus taught us to go another mile if we need to with one who asks us to go one mile. Well, let's go two miles if possible to preserve peace and to perpetuate peace 
And sometimes we're going to find there are relationships and issues in our world that are already broken. And what do we need to do as Christians? Well, I believe God calls us to go in and, and promote a peace and say, do we need to, to sit back and say, well, that's just the way it is. It's just broken. These people don't like one another. That relationship's not going to work out. This workplace is going to be difficult. Or that social issue is always going to keep people on polar opposites of the world. And just say, well, that's just the way it is. Well, no, Jesus calls us as Christians to promote the cause of peace. To prefer peace. And see, if we're going to promote it, we've got to actually desire that we have it. Again, as I said earlier, sometimes Christians... I would pray have wrongly been accused of liking to find turmoil. But if we're honest, we've all seen people and know people who seem to prefer an environment of disruption. I'm going to ask you today, let's quit thinking about everybody else, but do you prefer peace? You, I mean, as a choice. Peace over disruption, peace over anxiety and, and troublemaking, is that what you would prefer? Or, or do you actually find great wonderment in the, the drama of division. Many of you know, and my wife claimed I was perhaps hypocritical over the fact that we went live on Facebook and then I actually activated a Facebook account, but I've been very clear for the years, one of the reasons why social media can be so dangerous is many people, even some Christians we know, have utilized and have utilized that medium of communication to be a place of troublemaking and pot stirring and I want to ask you as a Christian, whether it be on social media or in your social environment in the world, do you prefer peace over trouble? Do you act in a way to provide for a peaceable existence and resolution? We are called, I believe, in Romans 12. I read a passage from there earlier. I want to read from there again. Romans 12, picking up a little bit later in that chapter, what Jesus says to us about proliferating and multiplying peace in the world. You say, well, the reason I'm so hateful on social media is because of all the issues need addressed or all the people need put in their place or something. Verse 17 says that Jesus taught us through the Apostle Paul, speaking to the Roman church, repay no one evil for evil. Chapter 12, verse 17. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. Isn't that great? A whole lot of troublemaking is done behind closed doors in private places. One of the reasons that social media emboldens so many people, I believe, to be so vile and so hateful and so contriving toward other people is because it can be done seemingly in private and hatched out behind a screen and with our thumbs or our keyboard and, and giving us keyboard boldness to do and say things we would never do. Realize that our troublemaking eventually becomes public and our peacefulness is also a public example of who we belong to. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. What a great principle for living as a Christian. If it is possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink, for in so doing you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So much can be said there, a whole sermon series in this one text, no doubt. But we, we see here the teaching to the Christian that peace is a possibility, but it is not guaranteed. So I, I had to act. I had to finally draw a line in the sand. Listen, I've already said and I will repeat it again that this proliferation of peace is not to call a Christian to be a pure pacifist and never respond. We can look at the life of Jesus and we know that when there were those in trouble, he said, we interact into that trouble. Someone needs ministry and it's a difficult circumstance. The Christian gets off of the middle of the road of our safety zone and into the ditch and helps someone who's in difficulty. Yes, we may involve ourselves in their anxiety and their travail, but that's what God calls us to do. Jesus himself, when he found things that were so 
off-putting in the temple there as they were supposed to be worshiping and selling and merchandising the, the worship of God. He overturned the money changers' uh, tables and cleaned up the temple with a whip and a scourge. You have made my house into a den of thieves, a place that was meant to be a place of prayer. Jesus had anger. The Bible tells us it's okay for a Christian to have anger, but it's a righteous anger that God calls us to have and a purity of motive where we don't go off half-cocked and half-informed and blast everybody around us with needless nonsense as we often see out of some who call themselves Christians. Proliferation of peace can be done when we say as much as is possible to me, I will be a person of peace. I will let God be the one who brings vengeance. I've often heard people say, I've got to do this because they got to get told. I've got to do so and so because I've got to make it right. Listen, Jesus taught us and Paul taught us that vengeance belongs to God. You will ruin your life, and I believe ruin your spiritual health, your mental health, and sometimes even your physical health if you let anger and anxiety and discord define you and dominate your life. Jesus says to us, we can let go of those things, understanding that vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I already mentioned I grew up a twin, but I also grew up with a younger brother. He's the one when he introduces himself uh, he says he's the son nobody knows Michael and Janice Hunt had. Um, he is the troublemaker of the family, if I can just be real honest with you about it. When we grew up, we we all liked to fight. And I guess there was three boys, including myself and the family. And, and, and fighting and struggling is just one of those things you do as a kid. It doesn't make it right. I remember being taught that we were not to fight. <laughs> As we grew up, one of the things that happened in our household is my mom went back to college somewhere in our late elementary school years. And we laugh now, and she'll probably be here to hear this sermon in the second service, so I'll have to use a different illustration. Nobody can tell her I've used it. In the 80s, it began to be a big thing. People talking about latchkey children, which were children that were left at home with no supervision. Well, we heard about that because there were all these service announcements on TV in the afternoons when we were left at home with no supervision. And, and mom came home one day and said, Mom, we realize we're latchkey kids. She said, never say that again. <laughs> she knew that wasn't a good thing. But in the afternoons after school, we'd come home and between episodes of MASH and Laverne and Shirley and peanut butter sandwiches and all that kind of stuff that kids would do, take care of herself. Our favorite activity was, I guess, to get in a fight. <laughs> Now, we didn't think we would, and, and we always blamed it on Seth, because he was the younger brother. And he is meaner than we are, but he was smaller than we were. And I guess, looking back, we probably did pester him. We always denied it, and we said we didn't, but we would, we would pester and provoke. And my mom and dad always used to word that we were instigators. And I didn't know what that meant until I grew up. But by the middle or late afternoon, mom went home off and there would be times we'd be locked in the room and the door barricaded and my brother on the other side hitting it with a ball bat. You can go to their house today and it's still scarred. Trying to find some kind of resolution to this whatever we had going on. And we as God's people often go through life and say, I don't know why people are beating at my door with a ball bat. Well, sometimes we've instigated some things. Our parents would come home, and as good Christian parents did in the 70s and 80s, they just whip everybody. Because they were sure everybody did something wrong. I never really agreed until I got older and realized that, yeah, we probably were instigators. He had buttons we could push, and he'll be here in the 11 o'clock service too if he's not already here, my brother Seth. And, and we knew what they all were. <laughs> And we could find a way to push those buttons and to engage that activity and run and barricade herself in the bedroom. If we live our lives that way as adults, it's okay to look back over 30 years and laugh about silly things like that. But if we live our lives that way as adults, we're going to have a pretty sad existence. And if we 
think about it, we either are that person or we know that person. And by the way, if you don't know that person who's doing that, you may be the person who's doing that in your life. To continually find a way to instigate or pester was a term that was used a lot when I was, you pestered your brother, you instigated. It takes two to have a fight. Well, how do we get past that? How do we possess a different attitude? Because preacher, you told us we can preserve him well promoted and all these things. How do we get that in our life? Well, as I said, as we begin, if this attitude of peaceableness is going to define us, it has to come from the one who defines us, and that is from Jesus himself. How do we possess the peace of Jesus Christ? In John 14, Jesus says, these things I have spoken to you while being present with you, but the helper of the Holy Spirit, whom my Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. If we're going to learn to be peaceable, we've got to learn it from Jesus. If we're going to get peace, we've got to get it from Jesus. He will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all things that I said to you. Again, continuing in John's Gospel, he says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives to you, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You have heard me say to you, I'm going away and coming back to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said, I'm going to the Father, for my Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe. I will no longer talk with you much. For the ruler of this world is coming and he has nothing in me. But that the world may know that I love the Father, and the Father gave me commandment, so I do. Arise, let us go from here. If you were with us last week, you remember that at the crucifixion of Jesus, the disciples did remember these words. But the deceivers, those who were trying to pe uh, promote and perpetuate a lie, those are the ones that remember. He said he would rise. He said he would come back. He said he would send someone. And in fact, he did. And he told us that. And he did that in order to provide for us peace. Now, as Jesus hung on the cross, and we saw last Friday, and we had seven saves on our, on our Facebook and on our YouTube channel, men preaching these last sayings of Jesus, we see that it was the will of God to, in a since through the last will and testament through Jesus to kind of begin to instigate a, a, a giving away of things. If you remember, Jesus gave his mother to his friend and said that she's your mother now. You be her son and you take care of her. And, and you remember that Jesus, as he hung there between two criminals, he gave his spirit to his father. But our Savior... The one mediator, which really is a peacemaker, between God and man as he hung there, he, he looked and he foretold that what he would give us from the cross was peace. My peace I give to you. I know many families that have fallen and struggled and broken and relationships divided over someone's will and someone's inheritance. And what Jesus gives to us is something we don't have to fight over because we share it and we can all have it simultaneously. And that is we can have the peace of God. A peace that the Bible tells us in the writings of Paul, which is a peace that surpasses. All understanding. One commentator said, I'm glad he didn't leave us gold because we would fall over. I'm glad as he hung on the cross, he didn't leave us land or money or empires. What he left for us is something that the world didn't give us. The world can't take it away. And even the most frivolous Prodigal Christian cannot waste away the peace of God because it is a resource that is inexhaustible because it comes from the one who died on the cross for our sins. In John's Gospel, chapter 20, 
We find that Jesus, after his resurrection, was reminding with his words of those words. It says that the same day, at the evening time of the resurrection, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut up, the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. They were still afraid. They didn't remember the peace. Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet and his side, and the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said again to them, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. Jesus came to send us as his peacemakers. His ambassadors of peace. It goes on to say, as Thomas came, after eight days the disciples were inside again, and Thomas with them, Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. You say, well, I wish I'd have been there on the resurrection day. Listen, every day is resurrection day, and Thomas seemed late, but he wasn't really late. Because there was still peace for him. So many resources like gold or land. I wish I could have been there and got at the front of the line. And so many people hoarding so many things in this day and time. And they want to be in the front. And they want to get it all. But listen, if you hadn't found Jesus, there's still peace for you today. You may have lived your whole entire life without it. You may have lived up until this point in time looking at others that had it and not understanding what makes that person different. But what makes that person different, different is the peace of God in their life. We're called to let the peace rule in our life. As Spurgeon said, we are so glad that the peacemaker has, hath putteth himself between the two. Talk about the sides. <laughs> the sides which were at war. You say, do I, do I have peace? We can have peace because the peacemaker, Jesus, Put himself in between the two parties. So it's not my conflict. But Jesus got in the conflict for you. Jesus got in the conflict for me. He put himself between the two. Between God and man. Between the crowd and the cross. And he took the hatred of sin of God. And the hatred of the crowd. For one who came to bring peace. And Jesus bore it all. And all to him we owe. We as God's people have the greatest example of a peacemaker because our mediator, Jesus Christ, took the blows from both sides. Are you willing to step in to be not only a peace receiver, which you have to be, but to go to the point Jesus' example and call us to, to be a peacemaker? Paul writing to young Timothy in 1 Timothy 2 says this, Therefore I exhort first that all supplications and prayers and intercessions, giving thanks, be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may live a quiet and peaceable life. In all godliness and all reverence, it's amazing how many people want to stay in a turmoil about the situation of our world today, and guess and second guess and and, and talk and re-talk of every decision that anyone makes. Listen, let's pray for those who are in authority. Pray for those who make decisions. Having done so, we know then we can rest in the love of Jesus, that we may lead a quiet and a peaceable life in all godliness and all reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved, and to come to the knowledge of truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men. That man, Christ Jesus. Who gave himself as a ransom for all. To be testified of in due time. Paul says to Timothy. For of which I was appointed a preacher. And an apostle. I am speaking the truth and not lying. I am a teacher of the Gentiles in faith. And truth. God is calling us. To rest and live and apply the peace of Jesus to our own life first and to the life of others. Never in our lifetimes has there been an opportunity so clear where Christians could step forward in such faith as to say, we are at peace. And you can be at peace because Jesus Christ is on the throne. He is the peacemaker 
We can step into that gap. We can be known as the children of God because we have him as our Lord and Savior. Because he took the blows, we can go forward knowing that we are safe as we preached last week and secure. Ephesians 6.14 says to us, as those who have received the peace, stand therefore having girded your waist with truth, having put on a breastplate of righteousness, having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. That we can go forward preaching peace. You can go into your workplace with peace on your heart and on your lips. You can go into places of commerce where there are long lines wrapped around the parking lot and everybody worried whether or not there'll be any more toilet paper or hammers or screwdrivers or whatever it is somebody standing in line to buy today knowing that we're in that situation to be able to bring peace. Not just a calming of nerves, that's not what I mean. But a collecting of souls for the kingdom of God. To be able to say to someone, Jesus loves you. You can be called a son of God. So we've focused on the fact that it tells us there that blessed, happy are the peacemakers. Why? Making peace is not always fun. Taking the blows is not always convenient. Why is a peacemaker happy? Because while we're standing in the gap, sometimes suffering a blow, the Bible says there's a great benefit to that. We're called the sons of God. Kaleo, to be called. <laughs> Don't you love to be called? Don't you love... To be called, most of you say, well, preacher, I had a nickname growing up. I didn't like my nickname. Sometimes people call me this or call me that. What about to be called the Son of God? Sons and daughters of the King. Romans 8, 16 tells us the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we're the children of God. Galatians 4, 6 says, for all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Galatians 3.26 tells us that we are sons of God through faith. So what does it mean? We have to have faith to be the sons of God. The Spirit of God must be in us to be the sons of God. It will allow us and perpetuate in us a peacemaking life and a blessed spiritual happiness. John 1.12 As many as received him, to them he gives the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe in his name, receiving, believing the presence of the Holy Spirit in us. Second Corinthians, Paul writes to the Corinthian church that Jesus said, I will be a father to you and you shall be as sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. I don't know how you grew up. I don't know who your earthly father is, but I want to ask you who your father is today. Who is your spiritual daddy? Do you know Jesus? He wants to know you. He knows his sheep. We won't be able to congregate in with the, the true, the real. He'll have a way of sifting and sorting and knowing the name and the identity of everyone that belongs to him. And if you want to know him, you just heard me read that you can believe and receive and the Holy Spirit will come into your heart and you can be saved. So, well, preacher, I am saved. Well, I want to say to you today that Jesus would say to you, love your enemies and do good. Lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great and you will be the sons of the Most High for he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Aren't you glad Jesus saved you before you were savable? Before you were worthy because you never would have been. I never would have been. And because Jesus did that for us, we're called to do that for others. That's what it means to be the sons of God. Beloved, we're now children of God. I love this. And it has not yet appeared what we will be. Isn't that great to know? I remember growing up and looking in the mirror every day and thinking, one day I'm going to be better looking. One day I'll be taller and one day I'll be stronger. One day I'll be able to shave. I remember watching my dad shave. That was just a memory of childhood that's so profound. I want to do that one day. 
Last month I grew a beard. I asked people were asking why I was growing a beard. I didn't want to tell them because I'm just lazy. <laughs> we, we grow up and look in the mirror and want to look better, and then we grow up and look in the mirror and say, it's only going to get worse. <laughs> It's, it's only going to get worse. But the Bible says that, that the Word of God is like a spiritual mirror and we can look at it and say, man, we're peacemakers. We can be merciful. God calls us to be meek and humble. And it's not yet appeared what we will be. The best is yet to come. And we're going to know what we will be when Jesus comes back. And we know he's coming because it's still resurrection day. And he's still speaking peace to us. See how great a father, a love the father has bestowed on us in 1 John 3. That we would be called the children of God. And such we are. For this reason the world does not know us. But don't feel bad about that because the world didn't know him either. The world's going to identify us as Christians because of the peace that they see in us. It's going to mark us as family members of a different kind of family. The world doesn't have it. John Lennon wrote in a song that some of our carnal church members will know. Imagine there are no countries. It isn't hard to do. Nothing to kill or die for and no religion to Imagine all the people living life in peace. Well, we can't just imagine it. There has to be, not religion, there has to be faith in Jesus. The time of the Civil War, what Henry Wadsworth Longfellow wrote a song that we love to sing at Christmas time. I heard the bells on Christmas Day, and in despair I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said. For hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Then pealed the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor does he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail. With peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Song written in the depths of the Civil War when our nation literally tore itself apart in battered brother against brother. And the poet helped us see that God was still on the throne. We as God's people have an opportunity today to step into the gap and to be who God's called us to be and to find that there's peace in the valley. There can be peace in the valley for you today, no matter what you're going through or how you feel, if you'll realize that Jesus is your peacemaker. If you don't know him, I want to invite you to receive him this morning. By faith, through believing and receiving, he will come into your heart. Admit the truth about yourself to him. He already knows it. It won't embarrass him. And ask him to come in, and he will. He'll in no way cast you out. He will respond to the call of the humble. Be saved. Christian, step forward. Go out of this day into the next. Being mediators, ambassadors of the peace of Jesus Christ to all those that God puts you in contact with. Let's bow for a word of prayer as we prepare an invitation song. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to preach your gospel. It's the gospel of peace. God, thank you today that you are ready us continue, continually to go out from this place and to interact with people who are hurting and troubled in times unlike they've ever seen. And God, we can be identified as the family of God, sons of God, by the peace we bring to bear in that situation. God, someone may be here today and there are difficulties in their life and divisions and relationships with maybe fellow church members or family members or work employees or others. God, that there would be a specific conviction over a specific relationship, if it exists, to make peace before God and also with their brothers and sisters in Christ. We need to be at peace with one another. As much as it is within us, live peaceably with all men. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And as we sing...
And as we get ready for this time of response, you do what God's calling you to do. Either in your car or on your couch, wherever you are today, you do business with the Lord. As we sing, just as I am, ask yourself who your father is and whether or not you're ready for eternity. And whether or not you're going forward and helping others find their readiness in eternity by being sons of God, peacemakers to a lost and broken world.
praise God just as I am. I pray that you leave here today or that you uh, end the broadcast today if you're watching at home knowing that just as you are, you are right with God and you have found peace with Him and that He has called you to be a peacemaker. I want to remind you that if you're on the uh, premises right now, there are offering receptacles that you can drive through and drop your offering in. And if you are somewhere else, I had several text messages and phone calls this week. You certainly can mail your tithes and offerings. And also, uh, if you have not completed and finished your prayerful giving for the Annie Armstrong Easter offering, we're going to wrap that up. Uh, but we will remind you that this is the heartbeat of missions in North America that we can fund gospel proclamation, and we've never needed it more in our North American continent than we do right now. So if you haven't finished doing that, you can place that in an envelope and send it to P.O. Box 2445, Calhoun, Georgia, 30703, and that is Bethesda Baptist Church. That's our P.O. Box, and so you can send that there. Uh, we ask that you do not send cash through the mail. That could be dangerous, so uh, if you want to do that, a check is a better way to do that. We remind you today, you can give here on the premises in the receptacles, or you can send in your tithes, love offerings, or your missions offering. I want to remind you that if you're here on the premises, there is a basket on the front porch that has handmade masks that uh, some in our church are providing through uh, just some cottage industry and keeping themselves involved in what God is doing. So if you want one of those, if you can drive through and get out and get one, just don't make a line or congregate, just give each other space and take one uh, for yourself there if you need it this morning. Uh, one other announcement that's very important, and that is that we are in the, the, the go time now for Splash. Splash Gordon uh, 2020 is on still as we know it. It's the last weekend in July. If you want the details, you can go to splashgordon.net, but our church is always vitally involved and we haven't really had a great opportunity to push it but this is my pastoral push and we're beginning now we encourage you to do it you'll never have a better opportunity because you're home you've got some free time it takes about 15 minutes online there's a form you can fill out you can pay online or there's a place that will tell you you can send your uh, registration fee there as we've said here before even if the registration fee is a difficult part for you go ahead and sign up and then let us know uh, that, that you need some help with that and we will find a way to get you involved. Splash is a mission trip without the trip. It is here in Gordon County. We do missions, gospel proclamation. We do uh, gospel work projects around the community to help people. There's also a place on that website if you have something around your house that needs done, you're a senior adult or you don't have great help or you're a widow or widower, whatever it is that you might need some help from us, there's a project place or tab that you can click on and you can list your project there and it'll be considered. Just, just listing it is the first part, it's not a guarantee, but most years we can get to most projects. And there's also a place on there you say, well, uh, I could buy the supplies. Sometimes that will help your project be prioritized, but that's not always uh, necessary. But if you can help offset the cost with providing some of the supplies and we do the labor, all that's online if you will take a look at that and maybe you have a neighbor or a friend or a family member that needs help. The help is here. We are prayerfully expecting this will be the largest year for Splash as far as participants. That's why you need to sign up now because it's still early bird and it's a little bit cheaper to sign up now. But because of no summer camps in most places, at least through middle of the summer and a lot of mission trips have been canceled. So we will be in on the front of, of signing up here at Bethesda. So I want to encourage you to do that. And uh, if you're from another church, you can sign up too. It's not just for Bethesda, it's for our entire community of Christians. And so sign up, sign up now. Uh, we're gonna have a meeting on Friday and I hope when I get there, I say, well, there's 400 people from Bethesda signed up. Now, now we're excited, let's go. So you sign up and God will bless that, I believe, in your life, okay? Um, any other announcement we need to make? Okay, we're, we're gonna make it more difficult on you to get out of working in vacation Bible school. Because we've not been around as many people, if you were working in Vacation Bible School at Bethesda last year, you are working in Vacation Bible School at Bethesda this year. You have just been enrolled, roped up, tied in a knot. If you do not want to do what you did last year, if you'll let Delilah or me know, is what the message on the board says, 
uh, then we'll find something else for you to do if you don't want to do what you did last year. Uh, but we're going to take your silence as a yes, and we're going to go forward from there. Uh, Vacation Bible School, we pray, is still on, and uh, we're looking forward to that as well. May God bless you and keep you is my prayer for you. Thank you for all you're doing. Thank you to all of our music leaders and technicians and everybody, and we love you. God bless you from our church family to you. If, if you need us, let us know, okay? We have a website. My phone number is public knowledge at 770-548-7950, and we'll try to help you in what ways we can. Love you. God bless.